Thank you very much, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everybody. I just should just uh, say uh, I'm oh, uh, I empathise with you, Louise. Although it's not my children who've got uh, COVID, I've had COVID, so I'm recovering from COVID, and so my mind is a little bit of a wash. Uh, uh, so I may not be as as clear and as concise as Rachel and Rosa used to. Um, <laughs> anyway, good morning. I'm Paul Wallace. I'm uh, Director of Psychological Services for CAMS in uh, one of our provider trusts, Manchester Foundation Trust, but I'm also, I wear another hat working for um, Greater Manchester House and Social Care Partnership, which is a, a kind of a, uh, a devolved organisation looking at house and social care in the context of devolution in Greater Manchester. So my role there is as um, a CAMS clinical advisor, and I lead on two programmes specifically around um, implementing Thrive um, along with Angela and a programme team and also looking at uh, CAMS workforce development. So um, most of my time situated within a uh, provider organisation, some of my time looking at a strategic level at developments across Greater Manchester. So that's that's kind of my context and um, I suppose that latter hat uh, will be the one I'll be wearing in terms of presenting today. So I'll pass on to Angela to uh, introduce herself. Thanks, Paul. So um, I'm Angela Daniel. I'm the GMI Thrive Programme Manager. And um, my background, um, I worked in local authority working on the integrating of children's services when we brought um, health visiting and school nursing into that integrated working. Um, and then I worked in uh, public health um, across GM and one of the things that drew me into Thrive really was as we were integrating in our local authority with the health, it felt like mental health was separate. And um, when I saw the Thrive framework, it was one of the things that I thought, this is great. It brings everything into one system that we can all understand and work together. And arguably every service that we work in positively or sometimes negatively impacts on mental health and well-being. So it's great that we can all look at it as that system. So that's a little bit of my background and what drew me into Thrive. Um, we've got a presentation today just to go through some of the um, context of, of GM and what we've done and some of the early imp implementation. Um, and Paul's going to take the first part of the, the presentation and then I'll bring in on the second part. But with it being a quite a small group, please feel free to fire out um, a question. I won't be able to see you, though, I think, once I share the screen, if it's anything like Teams. Um, so please do feel free to just interrupt. Um, right, Paul, I'll share the slides and then. Thanks, Angela. We can start. Thank you. So um, I suppose I'm just going to, um, I guess, preface this by just saying again that this is this is our. Um, uh, attempt to or opportunity to think about Thrive in Greater Manchester and obviously we are working with a familiar geography, a familiar set of uh, kind of strategic relationships and so um, uh, we absolutely don't want to presume that this will be exactly the same in other parts of the country because there are different geographies and different relationships etc. So we, we're talking from our perspective and we hope that this gives an insight into um, our uh, our kind of journey uh, in terms of implementing Thrive so far. But we wanted to give you a little bit of background about Greater Manchester itself. So um, Greater Manchester is, <clears throat> is a relatively compact geographical area, all things considered, um, but it's a very large population. It's nearly three million people across Greater Manchester spread across uh, 10 uh, localities. As you can see, Manchester, which is uh, the city of Manchester, is uh, relatively no bigger or, or otherwise than many of the other boroughs, but is very densely populated, so by far and away the, the, the highest population. Um, but we, as a, as a system, obviously cover those uh, 10 localities. We're split into three provider organisations for CAMS. Uh, so Bolton and Wigan sit under one health provider, uh, Bury, Rochdale, Oldham, Tameside and Stockport all around the east side 
um, all sit in another provider called Pennine Care. And then the provider I work for, Manchester Foundation Trust, covers Manchester, Salford and Trafford. Um, so um, I think there might be a, there might be a couple of other points on that slide, Angela. Um, yeah, just to say that, I, um, as I say, that approximately we cover a population of about three million. Um, the the geography of the of of our conurbation, I guess, is pretty urban. Most of it, um, you know, it, Rachel Rachel knows from uh, Rochdale that that as you move into areas of Rochdale and Bolton and Wigan, etc., it becomes more uh, rural uh, or more of a mix. But it's predominantly a very urban area, and I think that says something or or. So, uh, is important when we think about trying to uh, work together and collaboratively across a conurbation, which I know from talking to many, many colleagues, can be more challenging when there are much greater distances between localities and conurbations and much less of a sense of identity or shared identity if you're talking across a geographical uh, location like Lancashire, for example, or North Yorkshire, where there's quite a lot of difference and and um, and and um, impact uh, by virtue, not just the geography, but that's a, plays an important part. So um, we have this kind of geographical spread, but it's it's not as diverse uh, or disparate as in other localities. So um, I wanted to say a little bit more about uh, Greater Manchester, which I think has made. Um, a significant difference in terms of us being able to arguably be ahead in being able to uh, come together as a system. <clears throat> um, Greater Manchester has been seen as a, a as a kind of unified um, set of localities for a good forty odd years or so, um, and some of that is. Um, is linked to developments like Manchester Airport. And it's often interesting when you um, have a sense in Greater Manchester of the impact of having a, a large international airport um, and the contribution that that makes, um, not just to the city of Manchester, but also a dividend for the, the 10 localities across Greater Manchester. So there, there are a couple of things that I think have forced Greater Manchester into uh, a, a slightly more collaborative way of working in public services for for a considerable period of time, and that includes um, the development of MetroLink, which is our kind of integrated tram system across Greater Manchester, um, and various things like Transport for Greater Manchester evolving as a um, as a uh, I guess a, a, an institution, as it were, um, or a body. What happened, I guess, four, five, well, it's a bit longer now, isn't it? Kind of mid 2010s is um, this uh, devolution agreement. So probably the first of its kind um, outside of the devolved nations um, to look at devolving health and social care budgets to a region uh, within England. Um, so Greater Manchester in that kind of, uh, uh, move towards uh, kind of northern powerhouses and the idea of uh, developing uh, a kind of infrastructure and levelling up in the north led to Greater Manchester um, signing this devolution uh, agreement. What that meant in practice for, um, for us, I think, is it solidified and it kind of um, reinforced the kind of politics of the region or the politicians in the region. Um, to come together with a more coherent vision of what Greater Manchester should be about. Um, and uh, people will be very aware of, because of his profile, I guess, regionally, but also nationally of um, Andy Burnham, who previously obviously was a, a government minister, which, which um, I think Andy Burnham's role as a politician, but more so also the appointment of a senior politician for the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership, um, at the time, John Rouse, who previously worked for the Department of Health, helped to kind of coalesce and bring together a group of what I would probably term big hitter politicians that allowed for a, a, a narrative to develop a, and a coherent narrative around Greater Manchester as a, a unified region. 
Um, in that development of the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership, um, not only was kind of centralised budget, a centralised budget of about six billion for health and social care devolved to us to manage in our own uh, particular way, but as the um, as the devolution agreement kind of spun off, um, there was also there were also transformational funds made available for innovation. So. It was the kind of a, a bedrock budget, but also some budget that was set aside for transformational development and um, services, uh, collaboratives, etc., were encouraged to um, make bids for some of those innovation transformation uh, uh, funds. And this is a kind of a long way round of saying that mental health services were very quick off the mark to think about um, how we used some of that money to innovate. So this was again mid 20, uh, 2010s, probably about 2016, 2017. And at the time, Future in Mind had just recently been uh, produced and um, Rachel, along with other authors, had developed the uh, Thrive uh, framework for system change. And we were fortunate enough to secure some funding from the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Fund uh, Transformation Fund to develop a programme team. So it's a bit of a long story to get to where we are, but hopefully that sets a bit of context as to why GM was, was kind of in a very good position, one might say, to uh, test some of this out. Um, and I'm not saying better or worse or comparing us to other um, localities. I'm just saying that we were in a good position to be at the forefront of taking some of this uh, this change on. So Future in Mind had guided some of this as, along with, as we know, uh, documents that are already well well um, well established and out there, uh, focusing on child mental health services. We were fortunate enough, I think, through our position from a not just a GM point of view, but a strategic clinical network perspective, to have a couple of leads who were um, linked in quite closely with um, uh, the future in mind development. So our uh, strategic clinical network, uh, CYP mental health lead, Sandy Bruno, was actually on the uh, the uh, uh, the group developing future in mind and and i think that helped also develop those links with peter fonagy john rouse other people um who were in the arena of thinking about transformational change so you know you could say that we were just in the right place at the right time there's a bit of serendipity going on here um but also i think that the uh, the context was was right so uh next slide please angela um, and I think that, I mean, the, 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 some of our slides are shamelessly cribbed from other sources, um, including UCL Partners and the Anna Freud. Um, but I, I think these are all, uh, th these are all concepts that are well uh, established, well understood um, and agreed uh, upon by everybody across the system, not just in GM, but across the country. But I suppose that we were, like everybody else, looking for a system that helped us to pull together some of these disparate um, but inter interacting, intersecting kind of concepts, accountability, access, awareness, evidence-based practice, not just for CYP mental health services, but for the system thinking around CYP emotional health and well-being, given the very stark, um, I guess, um reminder that future in mind gave us about the fragmentation of services across the country so here we were, are again in the mid 2010s saying what we'd said 10 years previously and 20 years previously that the system is very fragmented and there was lots of variation unwarranted variation we know the principles to pull services together but how do we develop a mechanism uh, to allow that to happen so uh, next slide, please, Angela. Obviously, you know very well about the uh, Thrive Framework. I guess that at the outset in 2015, 2016, <clears throat> when we started talking about using Thrive 
And then from about 2017, 18, when we developed our program team, we too were trying to get to grips with, and I heard um, a colleague just before saying about trying to get to grips with the, the thriving aspect of the model or whatever part of the model that you're trying to get to grips with. We certainly were trying uh, hard to understand how we made this um, operational, how we translated a set of very kind of clear, um, I guess, conceptual ideas that seem to resonate across the system, seems to make sense to change our language of describing kind of child mental health issues, but how do you actually make Thrive happen? And we were, we were really interested, this notion that somehow, um, and maybe erroneously, there was an idea amongst system partners that you stop doing one thing one day, you press the button and you did thrive the next day. And we were very much at pains to, to kind of help partners to think that thrive wasn't a, a thing. It wasn't a, a kind of a, a, a kind of an operational delivery mechanism that somehow suddenly made everything different but rather, rather was a model for transformational system change. And that that in and of itself is a, is a slightly more difficult kind of concept to get on board with. But what we've worked on in the last couple of years is to try and, and hopefully this will come out later, is to try and look at the, the multitude of different ways in which transformational change has to happen in order for us to call something a thrive system change process, if that makes sense. Anyway, I will talk about that a little bit more. So next slide, please, Angela. So what we set out to do at the beginning um, was from the top, really just understand our systems, bring system partners together, understand what was already out there. So this wasn't just a CAMS transformation process. This was a CYP mental health system process. So men uh, colleagues mentioned about understanding the offer from the local authority or VCSE partners or within education, as well as within uh, CYP mental health or public health services. So what we tried to endeavour to do is bring system partners together in each of our 10 localities uh, to really kind of bottom out what was the offer in a locality? What, what were the, the things that um, the VCSE uh, uh, mental health or counselling or emotional health and wellbeing services were offering? What were schools doing? What were the local authority and early help doing? Um, not necessarily, again, I, I suppose I speak for kind of one of the issues that we came across quite early, which is not, not necessarily to put all of those services into different parts of the Thrive model and say, well, this is getting help and, and, and signposting, or this is, um, sorry, this is getting advice and signposting, or this is getting more help. What we try, were trying to do was to um, give a real clear sense that some services, many services work across those different boundaries or those different domains of the Thrive model. But really what we wanted to do was just to bring people together to map what was out there. Um, we wanted to develop a systematic training program to uh, partners across the system. Um, so our view was that in, in understanding the system, obviously that was hugely important. And then we could start to bring system partners together and offer them training in some of those core Thrive principles, some of those core Thrive modules around the importance of advice and signposting, uh, getting, um, getting risk support, uh, when to end treatment, and shared decision making. Now, it's interesting, I suppose, and Rachel, I, I, I guess you would say very clearly, it hopefully would, would agree with this in, in, as, in as much as I think a lot of system partners would say, well, isn't that what we do? Don't we advise and signpost and share, make shared decision making? But I think it's very clear that you as, as, as um, the model authors recognize that some of these were core modules of training that just weren't available to large parts of the workforce to come together to think about concepts like holding on to cases for too long, uh, thinking about risk support, thinking about 
true collaborative shared decision making. And so what we were trying to do was to bring system partners together to really embed some of those uh, core fundamental thrive principles around training. Um, and pre-pandemic, I think it's fair to say we were we were growing, going great guns in terms of um, numbers and getting people together. That's been a bit more challenging since the pandemic and doing some of that virtually. With the ultimate aim of broadening the system, somebody mentioned before about wanting to broaden the offer, the range of people and services able to um, provide good quality support for children's, uh, children and young people's mental health and well-being. And we also aim to look at to supervision and consultation as a way to sustain some of that if we're looking to partner agencies to deliver some of this. And underpinning that, we uh, set out to develop a, a very comprehensive evaluation schedule. Um, there's loads and loads more information about all of that, but we won't go into that in great detail. But that was a, that's to really just talk about the process that we took. And much of this was was absolutely in collaboration with Rachel and the national team um, and your processes for thinking about implementing uh, change over time. <clears throat> so it's just to say that we weren't we weren't reinventing or we weren't inventing something uh, brand new. We were we were absolutely working in collaboration with our national team colleagues. So next slide, please, Angela. Um, this is just another slide to perhaps um, uh, kind of gather together some of the ways in which we um, have, have, I guess, evolved and uh, kind of changed things over time. So we were very fortunate in doing lots of these things that are in the middle, in the, in the hexagons. Um, we were very fortunate to have system leadership from GM from the beginning, as I was talking about before, the kind of politics of the system, uh, the politicians in the system were very supportive and obviously had provided some transformational monies. What that also provided for us, though, um, was a feedback mechanism or a feedback loop whereby we were constantly and still are having to account for um, and evaluate and publicly present uh, what we're doing. So. There, there is a there's a way in which that I think that's that's honed our uh, our ability to kind of feedback in a meaningful way to people what it is that we're we're making a difference about. What's been really 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 important, and I uh, absolutely would stress this, um, is the development of a program team. Funding to have a program team. I think if um, if we haven't had Angela, uh, which is amazing, and other members of our program team over the last three or four years to drive this and make this happen, then I think that it's very easy for things to start to drift. If you have a, a, a Thrive champion who maybe has it as a, a one part of their portfolio of, a, of work across a geography and a population like Greater Manchester, or I'm, I'm sure across um, your conurbation as well, I think it becomes really, really difficult to embed and implement these ideas in a consistent, coherent way. So I, I would in, it really uh, emphasise the importance for us, certainly, of having a programme team. We've then looked to establish 10 locality leads, doing lots of engagement events. The, the programme team allows for us to have lots and lots of consistent events, engagement, pulling people together, developing communities of practice, uh, lots of collaboration with the, the national team. Uh, myself having uh, some time to offer clinical leadership into the system um, has also, I think, um, helped in terms of uh, that kind of co-working together as a team and then translating things back uh, collaboratively to the uh, GM partnership. And then obviously use of things like uh, technology and digital platforms, although we've still got a long way to go. With, with some of that. I suppose that what we have learned during the pandemic is obviously how to use some of those digital platforms a bit differently. So next slide. I think this is my last slide uh, before I hand over to Angela. The reason why I put this one up um, is, um, I'm aware that it's quite a busy slide, but if we go right back to the original uh, discussions about Thrive and the uh, the model developers. Um, 
there was a real emphasis and focus on Thrive needing to be seen in the context of, a, I guess, a, a systems ecology. Um, so thinking not just about um, changing the practice of individual workers, but thinking about system change in a kind of macro, meso and micro level. And I think that the more and more we've we've been fortunate enough to embed some of this in Greater Manchester, the more and more we've seen that if you're doing Thrive, you're doing things at least at, at, at least three levels of change. So not only are we offering lots of training into the system to help practitioners look at the way in which they're doing things, making shared decision-making with clients or thinking about risk support or one-to-end -one treatment. We're also looking at uh, services themselves uh, becoming more thrive aligned so that whether that's a cam service or that's early help or a vcse sector uh, environment thinking about their flow or their language or their understanding of referrals and what they can offer so that meso level change and then we're also looking at that macro level change so how can policymakers strategists work together but also I think importantly, one of the things that we've started to look at is how can some of the structural, uh, I, I guess, arrangements that we have around CYP mental health facilitate uh, a different kind of conversation. So uh, to put some meat onto that, in Manchester, we've been fortunate enough to work with our, uh, with our commissioners. Um, to look to develop a, 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 what we're calling M Thrive hubs. So our M Thrive hubs are um, additional funding from a mental health point of view or a, a CAMS point of view, but really locating that in a community resource where um, workers are primarily focused on advice, signposting, and very short-term getting help in intervention. So very much about prevention, early intervention about liaison and consultation with other services now the reason why we feel it's important to put additional resource into that is um as many of us may know i mean i i, I spent many a long year um you know offering uh, an outreach clinic into a local health center uh once a fortnight i'd go out there and i'd see two or three clients and think that i was doing some great work around early intervention I'm not really sure that that made the significant difference to the uh, the mental health offer out in that particular area of Manchester that I was working. This is a this is a funded full time uh, resource into North Central and South Manchester. So we've got three hubs um, to look at. I guess changing the structure or the arrangement about that early intervention. Uh, navigational offer that's out there. So there's something for me um, that I would call macro change, which is around structural shifts um, in some of those arrangements. Above and beyond, you know, this is not to replace, above and beyond our existing provider or, or um, organisations around having a specialist CAM service and early help, et cetera. We are starting to find that our M hubs are, are acting as a bit of a pivotal kind of link between lots of different bits of the system now. So not just specialist CAMs, but our mental health support teams, our early help hubs, some of our VCSE sector colleagues, etc. Um, so I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Angela, but obviously there's lots of, hopefully there'll be space for questions and discussions at the end, but thank you. Thanks, Paul. So, um, I thought I'd pick up a little bit around the implementation and the way that we've used the Thrive Framework. So very early on, um, Paul and I attended um, lo local localities, multi-agency meetings. So we've got 10 localities, went to each of those. Um, and, each, and in each of those localities, I think they were at different levels. So some of those might have been the Health and Wellbeing Board that we went to. That was quite a high level. Other times it might have been multi-agency CAMs. Um, so we went to talk about the Thrive Framework. Uh, we also gave some money out to the localities and went and facilitated uh, workshops in each of the localities. And we're concentrating that first bit around mapping. So what we've already got there, um, what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, we, had, we had professionals there. We had um, 
an education there with schools there we had a local authority there with voluntary sector there and it was really interesting some of the things that came out there because we would map what we had in the system and we would say questions like well if you didn't have cams and have gps who would you pull in for help around mental health and well-being and um the, the most interesting list came from um, our education settings there was a lot of services that were out there that we weren't aware of in in health or in local authority that our school settings were um, and then it was a little bit well what's good about these services what works well with them and what doesn't work so well are, are the evidence-based interventions whereabouts do they sit in that framework so we did a lot of that in that first year um, we got thrive leads so we have 10 leads from each of our 10 localities and we in the beginning we met monthly now we meet bi-monthly we had a um, community of practices and what we try to do is focus on different parts of the thrive framework so some of it we might focus on shared decision making so we would have a presentation around shared decision making then we would do um, each of the 10 localities have their own tables which was multi-agency sometimes they had parent reps there um, and and young people reps and then we would have like a, a workshop for them to facilitate and think around shared decision making within their locality we also, um, Paul and I, connect with a lot of other GM programmes and we bring the voice of what Thrive is into those programmes. And we work very closely. Um, we have a wellbeing programme across GM that we work closely with, which really that wellbeing programme runs throughout Thrive and is our thriving part of the Thrive framework. Um, we work very closely with our trauma programme um, and we, th we think about that as a way of thinking around how trauma and, and adverse childhood experiences impact on our children, young people and families, and that we've used the Thrive Framework together. Um, what we did do, it took us a couple of years, really, I would say, Paul, um, for us to think about what is that vision of Thrive in practice? What does it really mean? So what does it mean in those needs-based groupings? What do localities need to do in each of those needs-based groupings to have an offer um, and th think about that offer? What's the role of our different professions? Um, you know, what's the role of a social worker within the Thrive Framework? And, you know, our future vision really is that social workers should be able to understand where our children and people are in that Thrive Framework. They should be able to offer them um, ways of well-being and promoting their well-being. They should be able to know where to signpost them or give them advice. And if they need getting help and more help, they should be sat with a colleague in mental health professions to be able to um, get that offer for our children young people. We, we knew around um, some areas that we, we, we were very mindful of not going in and just telling people what they should do. And, and we, we, we went around developing kind of nudge approaches, which is a very public health approach, I suppose. Um, but we were thinking about it, um, consultation. We know that if we're going to broaden that system, we need to um, bring our mental health professionals close to those who work all the time with our children and people to support them. And, and, and gain and spread that understanding. So consultations are really important. And Paul gave an example of that within a, a community. So, you know, that hub is offering consultation to our education settings and to our early help within that community. Um, and we also know that certain young people who are more at risk of developing mental health issues in our YOS and our social care. So how do we get our mental health professionals closer? So we did, a, we would do a, a consultation, a, a, a module around it, and we would get commissioners about why they would commission and someone to do a consultation. We'd get people who deliver consultation about why they did that, and then we'd get people about the impact of it. And it was a way of getting people to understand the importance of it, and then make their own decisions about where consultation fits within their locality. We have a comprehensive outcomes framework, which is probably a presentation in itself. Um, and we started off with a comms and engagement strategy plan and plan at the beginning, but we also said to localities, they need their own comms and engagement. So we had a GM one, which we shared with everybody, but localities needed their own comms and engagement strategy. Um, we have um, newsletters, um, we use our community of practice, um, but we also had a, a language that we were talking about. Not everyone gets better in mental health services. We all need to know that, and we all have a role to play in that. And that was some of the, the comms out. Um, some areas who really took that on have really, you know, we can think of a couple of areas in, in, in GM who had their own community of practices. So we have a GM community of practice, but based on their own, and set up their own newsletters um, and it's a really good way of keeping everybody informed around the system so we also think that you could use thrive as a strategic tool so you can use it to identify where your system is in the needs-based groupings um, but you can also step back and use it as that leadership so um, it helps with our leadership of using the same language and having that system the same system in front of them to think about where what what 
services are offering, how they connect. Um, we have principles, um, as you all know, around the, the, low, um, the Thrive model that really sit well with everything we're trying to do around integrated working and that shared decision making and in treatment. And we, find, we see it as a key enabler. We see the Thrive programme as an enabler of all of the programmes. It supports all of the programmes in, in delivering what they need to deliver. It, it does both around variation. So there's less variation because we're using the same language and the same framework, but there is variation within that. So we have a, a vision around having a single point of access or a single point of navigation, but they do look different in each of the localities. And that's due to the fact we don't actually know what's the right system yet for that. And it's good that we do have these different variations so we can learn from them. And that's a lot around that community of practice. We keep bringing it back. Okay, so what's everyone doing? How's it working? <clears throat> what's working well in that and what's not working? How do we share that? It brings the programs together in sports connection. And I'll give some examples of that soon. It's understood by everybody, the language. So it doesn't matter what profession you're in. It doesn't matter if you're a child or young person. The language of Thrive is understandable. Tier two, tier three, specialist targeted level one, two, three are not always easily understandable by different professions and those who work within it. And um, it gives us all, a, a, again, what I said before about that understanding about the limitations of evidence-based interventions. Not everyone's gonna get better in mental health services and that's just a fact. And it's something that we need to think of as a system of how we can support um, our children and people and their families. So our um, program team together, uh, you know, we're trying to make that system change at a leadership level we're doing systems and, and we're, we're supporting the system change. Um, and we do, we have examples of pathways that start to be thrive aligned and services that are starting to be thrive aligned and thinking that way. And I'm sorry, the only things missing on here is that um, professional and person themselves, that change that's happening there. Um, so like I said before, by putting some of the programs and using the Thrive framework, um, helps us connect them. So we, we know that, you know, some of the future around mental health needs being trained in every education setting how do we support them you know, rather than leaving them just being trained on their own education setting how do we support them how do they know about our advice and signposting offer how do they know about our single point of navigation how are they supported by our mental health professionals either via mental health support teams if they're in the education settings themselves or via our CAN services or via maybe a model that like Paul said in Manchester we have a hub we need to support these mental health leads if they're not on their own and they're thinking about that mental health and well-being within uh, the education setting. So by bringing these different programs in, um, you know, we have the Health of Schools pilot that we did in, in GM. It helps us by putting them into that framework to start to connect to the other parts of the system that we needed to connect to. It makes us more mindful around that. Um, these are different programs that happen at a GM level. And by using the Thrive language, we know whereabouts they sit in that framework and where they need to connect. Our um, kuth.com, I don't know if you have the same in, in Wolverhampton, but um, it, it offers advice and signposting, but it also offers some getting help that has some counselling. So it's thinking about that language and, and that system about the different offers. And on that, every single service for us should be offering thriving. Everyone should be thinking about promoting well-being, how emotionally friendly are their environments, etc. Complex safeguarding for us is an, an example of risk support in practice. So the mental health professional there is often consultation to another worker rather than working directly. So using that language gets people to start familiarising and understanding those different parts of the Thrive framework and what that means. But also it puts our programmes in there and makes sure that we can connect them to different parts of the system. Um, I was saying before around that um, consultation into communities via um, means of like a hub or maybe directly with our um, mental health leads that have been trained in schools. But also we know there's some young people, as I said before, that are more at risk. So how do we get our mental health professionals up in consultation into those services? And these things also give us a bit of a, an infrastructure for when you roll out things around trauma-informed adverse child experiences training. We have that infrastructure of support back to our mental health professionals. So the GMI5 programme, we concentrated on the kind of five strands, really. We helped implementation in localities through implementation plans. We had our five leads meetings, coaching, workshops, et cetera. Our tra tra training academy, we delivered training. We also create some training. Um, we've created a, an arts and culture program um, training, e-learning, about thinking about the science behind arts and culture and that impact on mental health and well-being. We thought around um, broadening the offer because if we're going to embed shared decision making, then we need to have more choice for our children and people. And we need to be thinking about the system bigger than just CAMS. We need to be thinking what else is out there. 
we need to evidence the impact of these different parts of the system. So if we are using arts and culture, how are we evidencing the impact on that um, um, on our children, young people, mental health and well-being? And we have um, actually created an evaluation framework for our arts and culture sector that sings to our health sector because it uses some of the outcomes that our health sector uses. Um, so we have a, a programme manager for that. So we have our whole programme around the arts and culture um, and we're really trying to develop that more in our localities. We have a comprehensive outcomes framework. We do surveys, we collect implement implementation stories to share that learning. We've developed some I Thrive standards about what we think should happen within each of those needs based groupings. And we have that connection that goes back to what we said before around that leadership. We connect with other leaders, we go with other programmes, um, we support localities direction. And we also, there's a thinking now around you know, our RCS and ICO how they could maybe use a Thrive Framework, all age. So the risks and issues, well, it's having that strategic vision to deliver Thrive, especially at a leadership level. So sometimes in some of the localities, I don't think it was high enough as a vision. Um, so sometimes it might have been um, at CCG level, but actually the Director of Children's Services wasn't bought in yet, or Chief Exec. So it, it was a little bit around, okay, well, let's have that shared vision. And I can see it already in some of the localities where suddenly the Director of Children's Services has gone, yes, brilliant. And it's really going, implementing very quickly in that area. Um, the governance from the localities, just what I was saying there, there's a, there was a bit about where Thrive um, reported into, what level of board it reported into, who was on that board. And when it got to the, the higher boards where you might have had a, a Director of Public Health on there, Director of Children's Services, your CCG, that worked better because it had that system overview. And sometimes it might delivered into um, a CAMS multi-agency team where you might have had a, I don't know, a team manager from social care there. So not really high enough for that system change. Um, we're struggling, I would say, with the uh, training and embedding practice. Um, so we have done a lot of training, but it's nowhere near enough. And we're still thinking, of different ways of how we can do this and make this throughout our, our workforce. And I think that's a lot to do with your um, OD within, within localities more than what we can do at a GM level. So I think there's a lot of work we're doing there um, to try and think about how we can make that sustainable um, and continue to deliver. There's a confusion sometimes about what it's for. So sometimes people just try and re redo their own levels around it. All right, level one's thriving, level two's advice and signpost and level three you know, risk supports child protection. And it's really trying to say, no, it's not. It's rethinking your whole system. And actually some of your services um, arguably will be across quite a few of those needs-based groupings. Um, the capacity, so project management, when there's, when there's a project manager within a locality, it really does drive on implementation. Um, and I've mentioned about that and people's own interpretation of the Thrive framework as well. So, so the confusion as well, people, might use it for different areas and I think we were talking about that before where they might say well let's play it for our speech and language offer so this is what advice and side person is for speech and language is getting help for speech and language but then I, I think there could be um you know a risk of you saying all right well that children and people's mental health is in um getting help their speech and language is in getting more help their housing is in thriving that you know and then you stop go into the different domains rather than bringing mental health into that piece of work so the speech and language you would hope would be thinking about well where's that mental health and well-being of that young person and what's my role within that so there's different ways that that framework could be used i'm not saying there's a right or wrong around it but it could cause that kind of confusion so we um use the thrive self-assessment tool from the very beginning so we got each of our 10 localities to complete this as a baseline and then every year annually they complete it. Um, and what they've said fed back to me a little bit is um, it can be quite health and we're looking at that um, with the national team about how we make that more user friendly as a whole system. But they have found it really useful in thinking about whereabouts they are as a system together because if you do it multi-agency together, you are learning and, and challenging each other about whereabouts you are in your maturity system and what may need to happen next. And you know, some of those where it's worked really well, I would say, is where you have a um, commissioner that sits both in local authority and in CCG, has that whole vision system of where all the, the money is. And that can be done jointly working as well, but it does work well when you have that whole vision of, you know, you can think around your um, child, um, your education psychologists, 
your um, your mental health support teams, your CAMs, your voluntary sector offer all together, thinking about that as one big system, early help, et cetera, um, helps when you're looking at where you're putting your funding. Uh, it has to be repeated annually. And what that helps us with really is, is a way of us understanding what system change is going on. So we, we reported back at a GM level, we had an insights paper done that really deep dived into Thrive. And we're finding that our systems, and, and they range these, by the way, there's some localities that are scoring a lot higher than some of these are on here and there's some that are scoring lower. So these are the averages of the 10 localities together. But you can see a system change happening. You can see year on year that kind of macro principles are changing meso. The micro one's the one that's um, a little bit behind, but that might be due to a few reasons. One is just some of the recording uh, mechanisms. So in the Thrive for, um, in the Thrive assessment tool, it has things around um, um, collaborate that's not familiar with some of our services for user and for measurement. Um, what it also helps us with is that we have this, this, is, this to me is your strategic vision of how your system's doing. So you are self-assessing and saying, yeah, we're doing this. But our surveys that go out, we send surveys out to our workforce, CAMS workforce, our broader workforce, our children and people in CAMS and our children and people have been signed to the services. And we ask questions that are captured in these, these um, principles. Things around, do you feel like uh, you were involved in having a, a decision? You know, and actually some of the professionals feel like they do do that with their young people, but the young people, some of those are saying, no, I don't feel like I have. So they probably are doing it, but maybe not clear enough that the child understands. So it's, it's, it's helped us have that kind of strategic vision, your service level views of what's happening, but then the young person views. And that's a system change. And we know that's going to take years. And that's the other thing I think we knew from the very beginning um, that this is going to take years. And our service, our, our commissioners knew that as well. So everyone has that in their mind. This is not just a three year transformation. This is many, many years of trans transforming our services and our system. That's it, any questions? Thank you very much, Angela and Paul. A very comprehensive overview of uh, uh, an awful lot of work over the past four plus years. Um, so lots for people to, to have a bit of a ponder on, but yes. Um, do formulate any thoughts or comments and questions for Paul and Angela. They're just going to be with us for, for a short time now. So um, you've got your opportunity. Dean. That was just an amazing presentation. Thanks so much. I think, uh, Paul, uh, I, I was fascinated by the big uh, politic element of, of your uh, kind of first 10 minutes. And Certainly we, like all regions, we have a very interesting uh, political landscape uh, in, in and around the black country and, and a bit like your 10 borough model have some really distinct um, uh, borough systems, but also, you know, some wonderful diversity uh, across our boroughs. So j j just a view from you as, as we, obviously we're going through elections currently and will be, uh, what would your view be if you hadn't had that kind of Devo Mank huge political wave behind you? Do you think it would have taken a significant longer time to deliver, you know, the the, the initial project approach for, for Thrive in and across that system? Um, I think it's a really, really important reflection back on where we were five, six years ago. I think what what Devo Mank did I suppose was force everybody into the room um, to think about what how we're going to do this and you know if, if I think about my relationship to all of that back then you know if I, I was a you know a, a senior psychologist in in our provider services and we're not really kind of uh, quite remote from all the politics of all that was going on um, but I think being starting to be pulled into some of those arenas where uh, commissioners were for each of the 10 localities were sat, where senior education leads were sat, where there was an attempt to get BCSE leads kind of cohering across the 10 localities, for example. That just seemed to be, it seemed to be a moment in time, you know, where, where you have these things where 
there are a number of key events where people are coming together and some of the, the conversations weren't fully formed at that point in time i think it is it, 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 as with lots of these things it is a bit kind of chance luck serendipity really that you know it just happened that um one of my colleagues sandy bruno was having conversation with peter fonagy and the, the national team and there was a kind of oh well, could we give this a go it just happened that there were large-scale events to talk about devolution in Greater Manchester where people were going mm, could we put some money into this and should maybe each of the CCGs dip into their pocket for 10k a year or 20k a year which would make 200 grand to give us a, a program team and then somebody kind of comes up with the idea well why don't we put in a bid to these transformation funds so we get it centrally from GM and it's, it feels like a step of a set of sequen uh, sequences or, or kind of events that we we did certainly didn't plan uh, just sit, sort of kind of came together in the right way at the right time um so i'm not sure that answers your question dean but it does it does speak to i'm not sure that we were you know we were we were politically minded or astute enough to think well we know that let, let's play this you know this 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 uh, move next and this one next i think that maybe there were some other people one of my colleagues at um al ford who was our gm cyp commissioner um at the time kind of helped to move a few things around but uh, but I, I do think that some of it was just um having a few 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 key people who weren't hugely invested in their own particular provider or their own particular style of doing things you know i could have said well i need it all to be we need it all to be very clinically focused because i'm a clinical psychologist but actually that's not the way to approach it it's, it's kind of coming back to that nudge public health kind of seeing yourself as a change agent rather than a you know the the, the person who dictates and tells people what to do um, because the politicians are never going to take kindly to that are they <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Paul. Really helpful. Thanks, Dean. Um, any other comments, Max? Yeah, I'm not sure. I thought about the idea of having an I Thrive team. So I think I think there's things I'm thinking. Oh, we were doing this really different. So I suppose Dean kind of that feeds into Dean what you were talking about earlier about clinical and um, teams being involved but also it sounds like you have dedicated resource to this that these aren't people who do this on top of the day job and on top of the other bits that like you know COVID clinics and other things that get thrown at you um, so yeah so that's an interesting concept and um, I think Dean you're right we have got four very different councils that we work to and um, yeah okay no no yeah and the other cheeky thing is can we have copies of your slides because cheeky is my middle name to be fair but yeah thank you that'd be lovely yeah absolutely i i, I mean I, I do i still come back to i think that we were <clears throat> we've hugely benefited from having a dedicated team of people and um i, I think it w w i think that there was a, a substantial amount of investment to begin with because there was a, a clear collaboration between ourselves and the national team to to effectively um it felt like pump prime almost to make this this a, a, as effective as it could be in terms of the um uh, both the practice but the evaluation of it however i would say and rose obviously you know as a national team you're working on this um in terms of what that program support might look like but we certainly feel um, that without Angela um, as a full-time program manager, as a data analyst time, an assistant psychologist, um, and, and project coordinator time, that that kind of adds up, but it's not kind of doesn't break the bank necessarily. That we wouldn't have been able to get to where we 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 are now, and that's three, four, nearly five years now of of kind of clear, consistent dedicated time to this um so yeah i, I would just endorse at the, at the very least that there is a consideration of, of some program support for it dedicated program support right thank you very much um paul and angela and uh 
And I am very aware that we just um, managed to nab you for until 11. So um, uh, we've just gone past that. So if there aren't any other pressing questions, we'll just give a huge thanks to you both for coming along. And um, yeah, big round of applause from all to give you a virtual clap as well. <laughs> um, so thank, thanks ever so much. And uh, yeah, we can distribute the slides as well as obviously we've recorded this. So we can um, chop um, perhaps the, the GM bit as well so that you can circulate that for others um, to watch and, and hear how they've implemented. So thanks very much to you both. Do feel free to, um, to drop out. And uh, if, if there are any other questions, we might send them your way if they crop up as well, if that's okay. But thanks to no you both. No problem. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.